Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Come on in. We're so happy to have everybody here today. Right now, we have our attendees who are joining our panelists. And we'll get started in about two minutes. So come on in, get set up, test your sound. We'll be ready to go. I'm going to get a water glass like Dennis has got. Well, That's I have I have coffee because I need the caffeine after the hike. Ah. We're talking about your mental health, right? And uh, things that can make you feel younger. That's going to be Ooh. our topic. We like that. Activities to keep you young. Hey, Karen, welcome. We're so happy to see everybody here today. We're going to get started in just a minute or two. I'll be right back. All right. And remember, this is going to be recorded and it'll be up on YouTube. So if you want to share it uh, with family and friends, feel free to do that. We're so happy to have you guys do that. It'd be great if you sent us the link to that YouTube uh, afterwards. Yes, I'm um, Natalie. I'll do that for sure. Thank you, Natalie. Yeah. Otherwise, it's hard to find anything on YouTube these days. Well, what happens is you go down a rabbit hole. You go in there looking for one thing, and you spend time watching how to clean your headlights on your car. That's right. Exactly right. And, hey, do you know how to do that? Because I need to change my headlights. So like, oh, just Google it, and, and they'll show you what to use to wash your headlights. I actually you know? do have one light out. Not the headlight, but the little one. Yeah. yeah. Well, without further ado, I think we'll go ahead and get started. We want to welcome you here today to the LT Senior Services webinar. We've been holding our webinars almost weekly since COVID happened. We are going to be moving to a monthly format. Uh, but we are happy today to have our speakers here talking about activities to help keep you young. LT Senior Services is designed as a LT resource to serve aging adults and their families in the community. So one of the things that we do are these seminars, and we used to hold them in wonderful places such as our library. Karen's with the library. Hey, Karen. Uh, so she's with Lake Travis Library. Karen, tell us a little bit about Lake Travis Library and what's going on right now. Yeah, thank you so much, Natalie and Cindy. So the library was closed for about nine weeks, and now we're providing curbside reserve pickup service. So the library building is still closed to patrons, unfortunately, but um, you can request an item either online through the online catalog, or you can call or text, and then we'll pull it. And once you get notified that it's ready, you can pick it up outside the library between 11 and 3, Monday, Tuesday, not Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, not Sunday. So every day, but not Wednesday and Sunday between 11 and 3. So you can reserve up to 15 items and then we'll pull them. And then we'll, when you call us and let us know that you're at the library, we'll grab them and put them outside the door, outside the double doors, on a table outside the double doors in front of the library. And then we have a ton of online programs going on too. The calendar is full of all sorts of stuff. It's Zoom just like this. And we've been learning a ton from Cindy and Natalie. So we appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Karen, for giving us an update on the library. We hope to be back in the library someday. I'm not sure if it's going to even be 2020. We just heard recently that AARP has canceled all of their in-person events for the remainder of the year. So I think that's kind of an indicator for us that um, just safety-wise and for every other reason, it's not likely we're going to be live. So, so we're so happy uh, to have you here today, Karen, and we'll see you at the next one. And you can give us an update then of what's going on with the library. So Karen is one of our members. We have 40 members. We have both uh, for-profit and non-profit businesses who are part of the LT Senior Services. And uh, do we have anybody else on the call, Natalie, that is a member? Okay, I want to introduce Let me just double check. And then just some tech tips. Um, if, if you take your cursor, your mouse up to the top right hand corner, you'll see something that says speaker view. That's probably um, the view that you want to be in or gallery view. You can go into either one of those. Down towards the bottom left hand side, you're going to see where you can mute yourself. We likely are going to mute everybody except for the people who are speaking here in a little bit so we don't hear all the background. And um, then there's also chat. As you go across the bottom, you're going to see the chat box. This is where we'd like for you to ask any questions that you might have of our panelists. 
And we also have question and answer. I'm going to go to question. Oh, um, Natalie, Susie's trying to get on if you can help her. If you'll go to question and answer and see if you can help her get on. Okay, so that's where we're going to have our question and answer. That's just some of our tech tips. So our format for our events, let me go ahead and close this. But our format is I'm going to introduce our speakers, a little short introduction, and I'm going to throw it to one of the speakers, I'm going to talk to them for a little bit. But while they're talking, we would encourage you again to go to question and answer or to the chat and ask questions and we'll ask them questions. So our theme for today is activities to keep young. So let me read our, well, I have those bios right here. Hold, please. So our first speaker is Brian Hill, and um, Brian is a senior historian. No, first speaker is Dennis. That's right. You're right. You're right. Let me just go ahead, and I'll just get the verbiage out about you all first, and then I'll throw it to Dennis first. Thank you, Sam. Um, your life story video is uh, one of the top three senior gifts for others. And the your life story videos are your favorite stories captured for future generations. And Brian's going to talk more about that. Also, it's a tribute video. A tribute video is remembrances about a loved one who has passed. And then the third type of video is a thank you video. And those can be used for caregivers. And uh, Brian records all of his interviews remotely without coming to you. He uses a video phone all um, and he calls the senior over smartphone. Brian then asks a list of questions chosen by the senior. It's a great tool for Alzheimer's patients and other people. And you can find out more about Brian at brianhillonline.com. And Brian, would you mind going in the chat box and just typing in that information? That would be okay. Great. I'll be and happy then, to do that right now. Put that in there. And then Brian supports the Oral History Institute at Baylor University. One of our other speakers is Ed, and he's going to be our speaker actually at the end. And he's a member of the Lakeway Painters, and he's going to give us advice on how to start um, and what kind of paints and brushes and materials to buy if you want to become an artist. And you can also see more information about the Lakeway Painters in an article in the Austin Statesman. And I think we'll try to add that to the chat too so that we can see what's happening. The next Dennis, Dennis is from the Sierra Club. And he is a meetup hike leader and avid, avid, avid senior cyclist, leader of cycling trips to Europe. So Dennis, we're so happy to have you here today. Um, Natalie, do you mind muting everybody except for our uh, panelists? And okay, Dennis, I'm gonna just throw it to you right now, basically. Um, so if you could just talk to us about some of the physical activities like walking and biking and hiking that can help us live longer? Well, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about that, but something else even more important. OK? Yes. Um, first, I want to say good morning to everybody. And Cindy, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, interesting seminar. Um, this is my sweet spot in life, talking about and doing, not just talking, but actually doing a lot of physical activity because it's the key to our health. So just FYI, literally 15 minutes ago, I came in from a two hour, six mile hike in the Greenbelt. So I am all primed to talk about walking this morning. And, it, and it, the program I think is a great idea. As I said, I love discussing senior activity and how it is essential for us, meaning seniors for two, primary reasons. First, there's the physicality element of it, which after all these years, we all know about. Yes, walking is good for your body and it will increase your lifespan. We've been hearing about that for years. Less well known is my second reason and what I'm gonna focus on today. How walking affects us mentally. Very recent studies have proven that people who routinely walk are happier. Yes, the simple act of being outside, taking a 30 to 60 minute walk makes you happy. That's all you have to do to be happy. How great is that? So great that I do it three times a week, 52 weeks a year, rain or shine, hot or cold. And when we are finally vaccinated, 
you are all welcome to join me. <laughs> when I finished the 200 mile coast to coast hike across England a few years back, my feet hurt, my leg muscles were very sore and I was exhausted, but I was happy, couldn't help it. In fact, I was so happy that after hundreds of deep water crossings, days maneuvering through icky peat bogs and climbing mountains approaching the angle of repose, I never felt happier in my entire life. I know what euphoria is, and all I did was walk for 12 days. That special feeling isn't fleeting either. Happiness accumulates with the miles walked and comes back when prompted. The other day, the Washington Post ran an article, a travel article, about hiking through the incredible Dolomite mountain range in Italy. Yeah. Everybody's heard of that by now, I'm sure. It evoked very powerful images and memories as I did that same exact hike and felt that beauty and majesty, majesty all over again. Walking continues to make you happy even when sitting and reading at home. I wanna share the secret of, having said all that, now I wanna share the secret of how you can do long distance hiking. You ready? Yeah. Long, us. Dis long distance hiking. Okay. That's the secret. That's the secret. Almost okay. anyone can do it. Just start slow and keep walking. When, when did I start hiking? I started hiking in 2010, shortly after moving to Austin, all because I needed to walk my dog. When Boomer could no longer run following my mountain bike, we started walking. Walking is therapeutic for old dogs too, guess what? He lived another 10 years after that, primarily because of his years of conditioning. Three things to consider before going out to walk. Your feet, your stomach, and your head. Your feet. Oh, that's not Boomer, that's Todd, um, his younger brother. Boomer's no longer with us. Your feet need supportive and comfortable shoes or boots. Unstructured sneakers are not recommended. You want to know why you need fancy shoes just to walk around your neighborhood, right? Well, because older bones are fragile, our muscularity is declining, and we are losing our balance. That's a fact of old age. Your balance is markedly improved with sturdy footwear. Falling is not a good thing. We need support to prevent injury. I always wear ankle-high boots when I go walking. Doesn't matter where. I love good hiking boots. I have five pairs of boots between 150 and 220 dollars. Why? For comfort and support. In thousands of miles of challenging hiking, I have never sprained an ankle or injured my feet. I have worn out a hell of a lot of expensive boots. Get merino socks. They never stink and are always soft and comfortable. Merino wool it is. The best ones come from actually from English merino sheep. Daily foot care should include the use of a lotion, both before and after you walk. I personally suggest cocoa butter for its natural properties. Your feet will feel the difference. Okay, about your stomach. Your body is like a machine. It needs fuel to operate. Anybody who exercises without proper eating before and during a hike is courting disaster. It's called bonking. <laughs> He doesn't like it. Todd? Okay, bad timing. The, lands, the landscape people are here and he's gonna tell them to go away. Okay, sorry for that. It's called bonking. You don't want this. It feels something like a cross between a TIA and hypoglycemia. So eat before you hike and during. Likewise for hydration. Do not leave home without a bottle of water if you intend to hike more than an hour, up to a liter at least for longer walks. Your head, a wide brim safari style hat, which Todd just knocked on the floor, um, <clears throat> keeps the sun from searing your scalp and ears. It also blocks the glare of the sun, 
especially dangerous to older eyes. Skin cancer reduction, of course, is also a benefit. Do you think you know how to hike this glide and walk? Well, if you're not looking six to 10 feet ahead of you as you move, you really don't know how to walk. Most people are looking straight down at their feet. This limited view confuses your brain as it really doesn't know what to do next or where you're going. By looking ahead, it takes in the big picture, significantly improving your balance and speed without you doing anything else. Your stride is also very important. Try not to break it. Do not avoid obstacles. Walk over them. Every time you break stride, you risk, you increase the risk of slipping or twisting. Practice walking straight. Other equipment you want when starting out. Wicking polyester style clothing. Avoid cotton at all costs. It retains moisture, gets smelly, and of course is very heavy as you go along, adding pounds of water to it. You want a bandana, useful for injuries, and I've had to use that on several occasions, carrying snacks and wiping sweat off your face, of course, and a, something called a camelback. This is a small backpack with a bladder you drink out of as you're moving. You don't have to stop to continually take in the water. You can take it as you're moving. And this is the second most important purchase after good boots. You can put ice in it and store snacks, rain gear, et cetera. Finally, hiking poles. I'm not a big believer, but it may help with balance. Where to hike? Whoa. Austin is loaded with great trails. In fact, this is one of the reasons I moved here. Download the All Trails app which displays trail maps where you want to hike and where you are at any given time. It's very helpful. There are many apps and uh, you'll enjoy tracking your mileage and seeing where you went. Also, if you get lost, you can always use the track back feature to get you back to your car. Here's two of the best hiking trails for novices. Lakeway has really nice starter trails at the Hamilton Greenbelt. It also has bathrooms, water, a bird blind, and emergency markers. The Violet Crown is a newer trail system running from Zilker Park to Onion Creek, eventually up to 30 miles. If you can start at the section near Sunset Valley behind Costco, actually, Bushy Creek and Convict Hill Road, that's a flat walk that you can take all the way to the Lady Bird Wildlife Center. It's a great place to start your hiking to happiness routine. I'm gonna switch now to biking. Bike riding is my main sport. It's something I've been doing most of my life. My route, so to speak, to serious biking came after I could no longer run back in the 70s. Doctors put injured runners on bikes for a good reason. Instead of banging away on your joints and bones by running, spinning a bike crank is therapeutic, meaning it actually is good for you, unlike running. I started mountain biking in 1997 when a guy I did not know challenged me to do something called La Ruta de los Conquistadores in Costa Rica. I had no idea. It's a race that crosses the entire country from the Pacific Ocean to, it's a mountain bike race that covers, that crosses the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic. I had to buy a mountain bike and learn to ride to be able to compete in this four day jungle race of over 300 miles, 45,000 feet of climbing and temperatures ranging from the 40s to 115 degrees. What a blast I had. I loved it. I said goodbye to road biking after that. I also said goodbye to that guy who challenged me. He dropped out the first day. I finished three days later. That made me pretty darn happy. So in closing, I want to emphasize this simple statement. If you want to be a healthier and happier person, start walking and never stop. 
If you can't hike for some reason, get a bike. Even a stationary bike will provide everything you need and more without injury. Yes, your sore butt will heal. Finally, if you don't want to walk alone, look for the Sierra Club on meetup.com to find a variety of hiking opportunities. My group is called Morning Hikes in the Barton Creek Greenbelt. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, I have a couple questions for you. Okay. Uh, can you tell me the difference between a trail and a path? Well, that's a very good question, Cindy. Yes. Uh, if you ever hike in England, they don't have trails and they don't hike. They have paths and they walk. So the single most technical trail is going up these precipices that we, at the angle of repose, which means the angle at which things start falling down. Those are, those are paths, okay? We think differently of a path and they call it a walk when they've hiked hundreds of miles up and down the country or across the country. So I use it back and forth. So I have another question for you. Um, what is the difference, well, between a walk and a hike? I guess you kind of explained that. Same thing. Yeah. It's, there's no difference. So we were talking this morning before we started our um, seminar today, and we were talking about the fact that you live in a beautiful part of Austin. And you were going to tell us about the history of how you found your home and how you came to live right there at the entrance to a path for a, a hike. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm a lucky man. I have to admit that. I want the whole world to know. You know, it's a great time of life. We're able to do so many things. Anyway, I chose to move to Austin in, in uh, Christmas of uh, 2009. And uh, when I finally moved here in February, I was out riding my mountain bike. I told you that's principally what I do. It was before I started hiking. And I met up with a bunch of guys and they were teaching me the trails. So they took me up this trail. We popped up onto a street and we're going up a hill. And I'm in Travis country now. It's called the Pump House Trail. It's a major trail in this on the Greenbelt. Um, we pop up on the street, Travis Country Circle. There's a little hill there. And as I, I'm struggling to keep up with these 35-year-old guys, I see a sign over there. It says, for sale. Wow, here we are, right off the trail. Just moved here. What else could I want? So I went back the next day. No, two days later to check everything out again and look at this neighborhood where I'd never been. Remember, I just moved here. And there's a guy standing right next to that sign. And I said to him, hey, are you the agent? And he said, no, I'm the owner. Do you want to see the unit? I said, yes, I do. And I bought it right there. Oh, my God. Right on the green belt, biking, hiking, my dream come true. And I haven't been happier anywhere in my life except mm -hmm. since I moved here. Where'd you move from, Dennis? A uh, small town out west. Mm -hmm. mm, Los yeah. Angeles, you may have heard of it. Oh, yeah. Los maybe. Angeles. <laughs> I can see why you're happy here. <laughs> Cindy, there's a nice uh, comment from Susie in the chat or in the Q&A. Okay, let me go to it real quick. Um, so one of our people who attends our webinar is saying she's in two high risk categories with COVID and mental health coping strategy uh, is that I walk one to two hours every evening, mostly at UT, which is deserted. So I think she's mostly just making a comment, you know, that that is one of her strategies to try to get through this whole COVID thing and keeping her mind straight. And, and that is the ability to walk almost every evening. It sounds like you would agree with that, that that's a great way to help keep your mental health. Yeah, completely. Um, of course, now the landscapers are here blowing on the <laughs> <laughs> Great timing. So, um, yeah, the further out you can go, you know, the better. 
how did you come to form your Sierra Club uh, groups? Did you do that on your own? Did you join other groups? How does somebody get involved in a group like that? You know, that's a very good question because when I came here um, and I was hiking around, I'm looking around for hiking groups, there really, were, there really weren't any. But uh, I did find meetup.com and through meetup.com, I found um, a couple of groups and I talked with the sponsor and we started, the first hiking group was through a group which, you know, your people might be interested in if they haven't heard of it, it's called the Boomer Time. And so in Boomer Time, we started hiking there. And I have to tell you, that was also one of the best times of my life because it's where I met hundreds of people, many of whom I'm still friends with, many of whom have formed relationships. They form groups of friends, and uh, that 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 was an amazing coincidence at the time. So, and it became very popular. And so, after Boomer Time, the Sierra Club approached me. I'd been a member of Sierra Club for many many years, never really doing anything in Los Angeles because I wasn't a hiker. Um, but um, they approached me to see, uh, put my hikes on the Sierra Club meetup site as well. So it's at one point in time, I had about five or six different meetup groups. And this thing really got too big because I don't like to have too many people out. We're talking about fairly technical trails and you need to be in pretty good shape for that. So um, over time, you know, it just uh, morphed into a simpler thing. Now it's basically just for the Sierra Club. Lynn and I, um, our Sierra Club uh, leaders, outdoor leaders. So we can, we've also taken people on trips. We had fantastic trips to New Mexico and Arkansas, uh, where groups of 15 to 30 people, we go hiking, we stay in some place. It's, Sierra Club is a great group to belong to. They try to do great things. And um, I, I love all, all that participation and the friendships. Do you have to uh, pay to be that? How does that work? Well, there is a membership fee, but if you contact me somehow through Cindy, I can get you a membership for $15. Okay. Okay. It doesn't seem like very much people to have that uh, ability to safely go on hot hikes and walks. I think for me, not knowing where to go, um, not knowing the terrain, how to prepare, you know, just exactly. having to help you could make a big difference. We have, we have all that different, easy, medium, hard. There's also, many people don't know this, but the Sierra Club is huge in travel. They have national and international trips. In fact, our, our Dolomite trip was through the Sierra Club. And it's great to have a guide who's a volunteer who knows what she's talking about, you know, isn't being paid to run you around to different places. And I've never heard a single complaint about a Sierra Club tri uh, trip, national or international. You can do service work, you can go to New York and stay and do some work in Central Park as part of a service trip for the Sierra Club. Um, you can go to Yosemite when it's impossible to get in because it's all booked up. Service trips have first uh, priority and you can be in Yosemite. So belonging to Sierra Club has a lot of advantages. Excellent. Well, I'm just looking to see if there's any other questions at this time and I'm not, oh, oh, Brian wants to ask a question. Brian, unmute yourself. Okay, I will. Uh, I know how to do that. Awesome. Unmute. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. All right. Uh, well, I wanted to uh, give a testimonial about Dennis. So uh, years, years ago, uh, and, and the psychological aspect of uh, you know exercise. Uh, my wife had passed away. I was uh, not feeling great. And uh, I discovered Dennis's hiking group through uh, Meetup. And um, when you're walking, your endorphins are flowing and you feel better. Uh, physically, you get better. Uh, and you may end up being talking to some of the, uh, the people um, uh, who you're hiking with from time to time. And 
that stimulates your uh, mental cortex for discussion of topics. I mean, it's just benefit after benefit after benefit. And, uh, and I became friends with Dennis and he ended up being at my, uh, my wedding uh, when I remarried. So it was a uh, best man. Years. Yeah, that's right. The best man. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it's uh, something to try. Just try and see uh, what a change that makes. And uh, there, people are very accommodating. If you haven't done it before and you go out with someone like Dennis, you know, he, he uh, shepherds you along and, uh, and uh, understands that you, you're maybe not going to be as uh, robustly uh, athletic as uh, some other people. And that's okay. And they can accommodate that. Right, Dennis? Absolutely. So you don't feel like you're out of it. He's very inclusive and it's a, and it's a great thing to do. Well, I think what I'm learning from this, and I've never really gone there, is to go to meetup too. I mean, depending mm -hmm. on what your interests are, well, whether it's going to be art or walking or doing video, it sounds like you can meet up with other people who have interests similar to your own at no cost or very low cost. So oh, that's great. great recommendation. Well, Dennis, thank you. I hope you stay on because we might have other people who will ask questions. Um, but now we're going to throw it over to Brian. Um, Brian, tell us a little bit about recording life stories and how that's impacted your life. Oh, yeah. it's fascinating. Just like when you're walking with Dennis, for example, uh, along the Barton Creek watershed and uh, you're hearing people discuss things or learning about other people's perspectives. Uh, I've been a broadcaster and news reporter for uh, 30 years and I've interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people for news stories. But uh, when I went into seniors facilities for the first time and decided that I'd use my tool, my cell phone, to interview seniors about their lives so they could leave that for future generations. So they could, it could be seen by their granddaughter's granddaughter someday. Uh, it was fascinating. I mean, you can't predict when you look at somebody what their life is like. You don't know, you haven't talked to them, but we make these decisions about what Dennis is like, what you're like, Cindy, what, what Ed down below me is like. Uh, and you, it's, it's amazing. Uh, but not only was it, is it great to listen to people tell their life stories, <laughs> it's cathartic for the person who is telling their life story. It is, you talk about, and the new science is using parts of your brain that you haven't used before. Don't do the same thing the same way every day. Don't get up on the same side of the bed. We've had speakers talk about that in your uh, LT Seniors group. Uh, when you talk about uh, stretching yourself, when you talk about exercising your memory, and if you have something like uh, Alzheimer's, and I'll show you a video about this shortly, uh, it can be like a storybook. It, it, you can play it back later and it can help reinforce neural pathways that have decayed because you see yourself to, talking about those wonderful memories when you met your loved one for the first time, when you saw your child born, your, you know, all these wonderful mileposts in your life that you can document with a simple video recording. So my, my new thing in retirement is to, uh, is to interview people about their lives. And, and COVID-19 meant that I couldn't go into uh, nursing homes anymore to do this in person. A wonderful thing happened. <laughs> you know, it's this Zoom experience and um, using your cell phone empowers so many people to be able to record their life story with a family member interviewing them or uh, with someone like myself in interviewing them for free. I do it for free as a give back to, to uh, society. <laughs> and uh, I can go right into a lockdown seniors facility just using a phone and then record the, uh, this is an iPhone, for example. I can record a, fa a FaceTime call and uh, I'd like to show you how simple it is. I'm gonna give my wife a call here and see if she can uh, give me a FaceTime call because if you've never done it, what's wonderful is it's already built into the phone, no software to download. And that's often a big stumbling block for seniors if they have technical hoops to jump through to, to be able to have their story 
Hi there, can you call me back? Can you call me back as a FaceTime call? <laughs> she's out walking right now. She said Dennis inspired her, so she's outside walking. <laughs> so call me right back there. Yes. Um, so what's great is uh, it's non-intimidating. Uh, if uh, you have an iPhone, and most people do have an iPhone, the software is already built in there. It rings like a normal call. You push a green button, hello, and, and you're doing a video chat with somebody. That is amazingly simple. And so it means that anybody can do it, right, dear? That's right. I'm out in the middle of uh, Burbank and Travis at Fredericksburg. <laughs> <laughs> Live from Fredericksburg. Thank you so much. I just wanted to sh show everybody how easy it was to make a call like that. Bye-bye. Okay. Right, now, bye. what's I've done uh, research and uh, d developed a method of recording these FaceTime calls so that you can leave them for future generations. And if um, you want to mentally think of me as the senior, that what I do is I call in and... Uh, and, and they answer the phone, and it's that simple. I'm recording it at the other end. Uh, I give them a list of questions, 45 different questions that they might want to think about in advance. So um, we, uh, they circle, I want 42, and question number six, and I, oh, that question eight, you know, who is the most important person in your life? Uh, I like that one. And they make a little note, helps jog their memory while they're, uh, you know, if they have time to think about it, and, remember somebody's name, write it down and whatnot. They have a choice of sharing that with me so that when we, when I say, who's the most important person in your life? And you'll go, they say, oh, I'll never forget Uncle Bob. You mean Uncle Tom? Oh yes, Uncle Tom. And I can help them through the process of uh, getting over little, little bumps in the road, shall we say. Um, there are three things that you might want to do. You might want to write a book. You might want to record an audio uh, history of your life and your family, uh, oral history, we call it. Um, but you also might want to do what I do, which is the video uh, recording, uh, because you can see somebody's face. You can hear their voice. You can, s you can understand the passion about what they're talking about uh, when you can see and hear them. It's a very powerful tool. And when I do a uh, recording of somebody using the, the cell phone, what's nice is, uh, well, I, I should see if, maybe I can do a share screen and, and show um, my website and I can explain it to you. You can go there and you can see an example of this. So Cindy, what do I do? I go- uh, Go down to the bottom where it says share screen. Ah, yes, share screen, boom, boom. And then I'm going to try and see if I can get my uh, website up here in a second. It's brianhillonline.com. Can you see that, Cindy? Um, not yet. Not yet. Okay, because I have to push the share button. Yep, there you have go. to push share. There I am. So uh, there's a little video on there that explains what I do, the senior's life story, an oral history uh, video product, uh, project. Um, and I'm just going to go down here for a second. And there's an example of a, um, a, a video that uh, I did with a lovely lady who's given me permission to use it, Annabelle. And I don't know if you can hear her speak. I start off like a Ken Burns Sorry, documentary. I, I would say you go. got me started. Not sure, yeah. let, me, let me back it up here. Uh, so it goes on YouTube as a private YouTube video. It starts with a little text that's kind of dramatic. My daddy was a doctor. He was a, uh, an ophthalmologist, which is an otorhinolaryngologist. I, I, I ear, nose, and throat. Can you hear that now okay? they just say ear nose and throat because the eye specialists have their own you know their own practice but it used to be combined well anyway um he was just he was just so wonderful he was always jolly he was always whistling and he was just a happy such a happy man now did you notice there's text at the bottom of the screen yes yes so i can take that text and turn it into a book for you so it records your voice. The voice can be converted to text, and then uh, that goes as a, uh, a Word document. Uh, and so if you wanted to do a book, this is, and never got around to it, this is a way uh, to get a jump start on it. And this is a little introduction of uh, the work that I do. And I'm gonna play this video for you. Hi, I'm Brian Hill. 
I'm a retired TV reporter on CBS News affiliates in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Norfolk, Virginia. Now, in retirement, I'm still interviewing people. <laughs> I do Seniors Life Stories, the Seniors Life Story Oral History Video Project. There's family history recordings, genealogy recordings, and this video is about the perfect project under a stay-at-home order or a senior center lockdown recording seniors' life stories for future generations. Maybe you saw the excellent 60 Minutes segment about recording seniors' life stories called Talking to the Past. I urge you to watch their story. There's a link to it below this video in the description. Now that I've left CBS News in my retirement, I'm a seniors historian. And I used to bring my equipment right inside the retirement community to do the recordings. Well, now I can't go in. But I can interview them in a lockdown room using FaceTime. Contact information. You can also email and request my free list of questions to ask when doing a life history interview yourself. It's very useful. The senior can review them in advance. They can help jog their memory. And they can choose what questions they'd like to be asked. And they can make notes. Remember, we've lost so many seniors. Record seniors' memories now so they can be captured for future generations. Stay healthy, email now, and get started today. So that is on my website, and you can uh, go to it and see it and uh, email it to somebody, share it with somebody, and uh, they can see how this all works from the comfort of their own home. Um, I did want to uh, say that I do video, uh, StoryCorps is another wonderful tool that does audio only, uh, and they are National Public Radio's uh, StoryCorps project that has been going on for years. Sometimes you hear them on the local PBS station as a little vignette, and I wanted to play for you. If you're ready to cry, anybody ready to cry? <laughs> uh, take a listen to this. It's, very, it's a loving uh, example of what audio can do, uh, and, and it's uh, from StoryCorps. I'm Bria Morgenstern. And Excuse me, can you raise the volume? Oh, you want me to speak louder? I can yeah, raise my louder. volume. Yeah. Okay, let me turn the dial. I'm going to be interviewing my father today, and I'll be interviewing him with my sister, Bhavani. Dad, why don't you say your name and how old you are? I'm Ken Morgenstern. Um, I'm, uh, hmm, I think 81. That's right. Is that right? Yes. yes. Okay. All right, Deb, I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions. All right. And you'll answer them the best you can from your memory. So you came out here to New York, and then somehow you met Mom. I met her in New York? Yeah, you did. Don't remember how, when. Mom would remember. She would have remembered, yeah. Our mom passed away about four and a half years ago. Do you recall dating her? Oh, yeah, I remember dating her. She was a sexy gal. She was. So let's talk about your kids a little bit. We had four kids. Is that the right number? Yes, it is. Good. They were great. Who are they? You. Who else? It's Priya, Bhavani. Priya, Bhavani. And uh, there's a man in there. David, Dad. <laughs> David, oh, yeah. Dad. David's not going to be too happy when he listens to this, Dad. <laughs> Who's the best kid? David. He was actually the best kid. No, he definitely he was. was. And you see us all a lot still, right, Dad? Dad? What? Priya was asking if you still see us a lot. See you a lot? Yeah, mm -hmm. are we in your life? Sure. What are you talking about? <laughs> I'm just asking you a question. <laughs> yeah, what's your life like now, Dad? Oh, it's a wonderful life. I get up in the morning, go to sleep at night, and in between, eat three meals. <laughs> What's wrong with that? It's a nice thing that it's so easy to make you happy, Dad. I'm, I'm very much like, uh, I think, my father. Mm -hmm. He was an easygoing guy. Uh, people used to call him Happy Harry. And uh, I had a lot of its characteristics, I think. Dad, was there anything that you wished you had gotten in life that you didn't get? Anything I 
wish I had gotten in life. Yeah. I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, I have no regrets on anything. The important thing is uh, I have a family that I love and they're loving people. That's the biggest thing you can leave as a, as a legacy. Legacy, yeah. I want to tell you, Dad, that I've always considered you my guru and teacher. Well, thank you. I would say the same. You've been a role model for all of your family. People are constantly saying to us how lucky you are to have all of us. And I turn to them and say, we are because of him. You've created such love around you. And we want to be with you. Thank you, honey. That's awfully nice to hear. It's the truth. We love you, Dad. Oh, I can't watch that and not tear up. Oh. Isn't that amazing? I'll agree with that. Well, who did the drawing portion of it? Well, there's the actual couple there you saw. Uh, oh, okay. The, the flash by. But StoryCorps, that's National Public Radio's uh, radio project, uh, created these little animations. And there's a group of them on the StoryCorps site that uh, help, um, help you get the idea of what they do and uh, how powerful this tool can be of uh, recording uh, things. If you want to do a book, I'm just going to switch one last thing here. Um, are we still good for time? I'm hoping. Sure. Okay. Uh, if you ever wanted to write a book and you got stuck, if you wanted help writing a book, I can help you by giving you my list of questions if you email me. Uh, that, but these guys have automated the process. <laughs> uh, and uh, this is uh, called Story Worth. Uh, this site. How it works is once a week, I'm going to just go down there, uh, they, uh, they email you. They've automated things uh, and they email you questions that you've never thought to ask yourself. Uh, so the, you reply with a story about that question, uh, which is shared. And then uh, at the end of the year, the stories are bound up in a beautiful little keepsake book. So it's a way of bit by bit nibbling away at writing a book. Uh, over the year, they charge ninety dollars <laughs> for uh, for doing that. Uh, but look what people say: uh, "Story Worth is more than just a book," says Adrienne from Rochester, New York. It's more than a collection of stories, and it's the same thing when I interview somebody. It's the gift of time you spend with somebody, your family, if you do it with your family or with me, uncovering these wonderful stories. There's never been a gift that I, has held so much meaning or value. To me, she says. The one in the middle is Nancy from Springfield, Pennsylvania. I gifted this to my dad last Christmas, and it's been a wonderful adventure. I'm learning so much about him as he records his stories, all in his own words. It's priceless to me. And finally, P Patricia in Sacramento, California says, my children gave me story worth about a year before my 90th birthday. Most weeks, the questions made me think of something from my childhood. And early married life that I had forgotten. It's one of the best gifts I've ever received. Uh, so they've, they've been profiled on uh, New York Times, USA Today, ABC, and various media outlets. But take a look at some of their questions that are flashing in red here. Have you ever feared for your life? If you were to do it over again, what would you change? Have any regrets in life? What things do you, you know, the, the, all these questions are part, uh, are or are questions I ask or can ask, and you can choose, uh, but it's fascinating. Have you ever feel, feared for your life is interesting. Uh, if you were to do it all over, what would you change? I like that idea. Uh, so this list of questions, I'll email it to you for free. You can look at it, think about what you would, uh, how you would respond, send it back to me, and we'll pick a time when we can do an interview and you can uh, get this kind of, uh, use this wonderful tool of telling your life story for future generations and you can enjoy doing it uh, yourself. So I'm going to go back to me now. There I am. Um, so it's a matter of going to that website, which is brianhillonline.com. You can see those little videos. You can show it to a loved one uh, and uh, explain how th this process works. And you just have to email me and ask for a time. Uh, email me and I'll send you the list of questions to choose from and of course you can add your own and uh, I think that you'd, you'll find that it's uh, good for your mental acuity it can be used in, in 
uh, Alzheimer's uh, sense to uh, like a story book, which is a very um, familiar Alzheimer's tool. Uh, it's a video version of that. And you can self refresh some of those neural pathways. And it's a great um, therapy. Some people call it a therapeutic tool, just reflecting back on what has value in your life. Um, so uh, give me a call or send me a, an email actually uh, to record our seniors is on that website. And that's, uh, that's the connection. I do support Baylor University's Oral History Institute. And uh, I think it's something we should all do and do before you begin to fail. So I can't tell you the number of people who said, this is such a great idea. My dad told such great stories. I said, well, did you record them? They said, no, no, I, never, I, I wish I had. So do it now. And uh, also if, you know, some people ask, what's the best time to do something like this? Well, a stay at home order is a perfect time to do it. Or when uh, caregivers come into the home after a, uh, after you begin to decline and you're at home, you have no excuses anymore of corporate meetings and you know trips you have to go on and everything. You maybe you're confined to a bed. It's another wonderful time for you as a family member to interview a loved one or to have me call in on a, a cell phone call. I can use Android phones as well, but you do have to download Skype or use Google Duo. It, it, it's a little more complex. Uh, as it, or, or Zoom. So we can do it using Zoom as well. Zoom has a record function. You put family members on there. I can be uh, asking these questions to uh, a senior just by themselves, or you can add a couple of other uh, loved ones uh, in on the, uh, on the video, as you saw in that moving piece. My eyes are still wet from watching that, listening to that uh, story for uh, video. And I might say, if I do a video, I can convert it to text for a book, but I can also upload the audio to StoryCorps for you. And then that goes up to the Library of Congress and is, uh, is kept there as a permanent record. Uh, it's uh, a great tool. And I, you have a choice to take that interview that I've done of, they run about 15 to 45 minutes, half an hour to 45 minutes. And we put, can do a link on YouTube so it can be found in the future. Think about who's gonna watch this down the road. Is it gonna be somebody who's reading a book? Well, kids today, they're, they're into their screens, you know, and looking at things. And, uh, so I think video uh, that can be consumed on a, um, a screen is, is a good thing to leave it as, uh, for, as a memory. So you can leave it as a searchable one where they can find you in the future, your granddaughter's granddaughter, when she's looking for her family history uh, as a link on YouTube. Um, and then I can also give it to you as a DVD. I can also give it to you uh, as a thumb drive so you can put it away in a safety deposit box or with your will. And so when you pass away, there's this lovely um, remembrance of you. It can be used at a funeral. And, and Cindy, at the beginning, you mentioned that I do life story videos. I do remembrance videos, which is you couldn't get to the funeral. And so here's a little um, sort of a lovely vignette of uh, about somebody's life story with a few pictures in it. Uh, or your caregiver has been so instrumental in your life and you wanna say thank you to them. So I do a little video that is a thank you to uh, the people who've been locked down in these uh, facilities for so long uh, with um, this great dependency on this team of people who are helping them. So it's a great way to say thank you to them and do a little video on that too. It's free, you just have to go to my website and send me an email, brianhillonline.com. Brian, if you are a family member and you want to have another family member begin mm -hmm. this process, it's kind of an awkward conversation because you don't want them to think, okay, you're dying now or you know, whatever, now you want to hear my story. How can you start a conversation with a family member that makes them be open to the idea of documenting this information? Well, a couple of things. You could send them a, a link to that video, for example, from StoryCorps and say, hey, just take a look at this and tell me what you think. Mm -hmm. You know, and you say, oh, wasn't that wonderful? Wasn't that? Let's do something like that. Mm -hmm. You could use that as a, a jumping off point. Sometimes I say, hi, I'm Brian Hill. I used to be a reporter for, you know, with CBS and I'd like to interview you. And your, your kids think this is a good idea. What's a good time for me to give you a call on your phone? It's very simple. You just um, have to have your cell phone answer the phone when I call. 
simple as that. And I'll guide you through where you might want to put the phone so your picture looks better. You know, you don't, many interviews you see nowadays look like this. You, know, you see ceiling, you see weird lights behind people. It's very distracting. They're looking down at their laptop or something and they're got double chin. And, uh, you know, things look much better when you're looking up, when you have light on your face and I can help them put their, their phone in a position that's very complimentary uh, to doing an interview like that and, and, and walk them through the process. So I, I can uh, contact them and say, uh, I'd like to interview you. What do you think? That's one, another option for people. Uh, but mostly it's let's do a family history. You know, genealogy, family history is fleeting. And when somebody passes away, uh, the whole lineage of a family can vanish. So uh, you can approach it from that uh, perspective. When I talk to somebody, I ask, tell me about your dad. So it becomes an interview about that senior's father and mother. And, they're, and, and so it's way beyond just, hey, let's do something about you. Let's do something about our family. That's another nice way to approach it. Mm -hmm. I love it. Well, without further ado, it's time for Ed to tell us a little bit about art. And uh, Ed, we're going to unmute you and tell us about how important art is to help you to keep young. Can I, can I also say Ed and I have had this conversation, right, Ed? Oh, he's muted. Let mm -hmm. me see if I can unmute. Unmute yourself, Ed or Natalie. Uh, okay. Did we get it? Yes, we can hear okay, you. Yeah. yeah, no, Brian and I have uh, discussed it and I'm, uh, I'm on board to do it. I just uh, am uh, procrastinating about what I want to say and how. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a wonderful, uh, it's a wonderful little uh, benefit that he offers and uh, I'm going to take advantage of it for sure. But in the meantime, uh, I've been retired for about uh, 20 years and uh, when I retired, I thought, you know, I'm going to pick up art uh, because I've always had an interest in it and never had an opportunity to really do it. And so uh, I uh, was very influenced by uh, Winslow Homer and uh, John Singer Sargent. And, you know, and, and I looked at their watercolors and thought, you know, boy, that looks fun, easy, and I love them. So I'm going to start out and do some watercolor. Uh, and before that, I'd, I'd done some uh, sketching with uh, graphite pencils and what have you. And so I uh, had a little bit of a, you know, a, a strong interest actually in uh, art. So I go out and I buy one of these uh, little, little uh, cakes of watercolor and a brush and uh, some paper. And I uh, start out and realize, uh, well, I need some instructions. So I did take a class and that kind of got me oriented uh, toward it and uh, so I've been uh, in watercolors uh, you know for the last 20 years uh, I am not a professional I do it as a hobby I really enjoy it it's uh, relaxing it's uh, you know just a wonderful benefit mentally physically uh, in the sense that uh, you get up you get going and you uh, you know, you really uh, strive to do your best. So anyway, I uh, ended up we in had, watercolors. I, I and over... you, you had a conversation with me one day. Yeah. And yeah. I said, hey, Ed, I, I'm, I'm Winston Churchill, you know, great politician, leader of the, uh, you know, in World War II. He, he retires. What does he do? He writes a book. And then what? Then what? He became an artist. Uh, and, and I said, how do you do that? And what tools do you need? Uh, to do that, and uh, where should you start? You had some great suggestions. Well, I think, uh, you know, if I were giving advice to uh, someone starting out, I would probably uh, recommend that they uh, consider going to uh, some other medium other than watercolor. Watercolor is uh, the only medium that, uh, you know, uh, is time dependent, is uh, critical in terms of, uh, how you put it down. Uh, I spent an awful lot of time uh, in the past uh, learning the medium and uh, trying to get a handle on it. Uh, so 
if somebody comes to me and says, gee, I'd like to start painting, I would recommend that they get into uh, acrylics. Uh, the other alternative and the most popular uh, would be uh, oils. And oils are, uh, you know, the preferred uh, medium from, for serious artists. Uh, if you go to a museum, you rarely see too many uh, watercolors or any other medium, uh, pastels or uh, graphite, but uh, you see uh, predominance of uh, oils and there's a reason for that. Uh, you know, if you're uh, painting and you don't like what you've done, then you, uh, you know, you can change it. Uh, scrape off the paint, start over and, and uh, do it again. The drawback of an oil uh, painting is that you need, you really need a studio. You really need a place where you can uh, put the apron on, uh, handle the uh, paint, uh, which is, uh, can be messy. Uh, the cleanup is with uh, turpentine and uh, a lot of uh, painters have tried oils and it just doesn't work for them because they uh, can't handle the, the uh, aspect of the turpentine. Uh, they do now make a uh, turpentine that is odorless, which helps immensely, but then uh, you have the whole issue of cleaning up. So, you know, it helps to have a uh, sink in the garage, uh, you know, an industrial type sink to uh, do that. And then uh, you're gonna have to have uh, something to keep it off the floor. But uh, acrylics, on the other hand, are water-based, like watercolors, uh, and uh, with respect to uh, organizations like Lakeway Printer Painters, uh, they do not allow oils. Uh, they only allow water-based paints because you can clean them up uh, easily, and uh, if you get them on something, you can get them off easily. And, and you uh, might explain that that's a group that meets at the Lakeway Activity Center. Yeah, yeah. The Lakeway Ex Activity Center has a group that meets uh, Wednesdays when uh, we don't have coronavirus uh, from uh, 9 to 12. And it's just a group of painters that uh, are interested in painting. They, uh, there's no instruction, uh, but it's great to be with other painters and uh, pick their brains and see what they're doing and get their feedback. and. Uh, and you have the camaraderie, and then you, uh, every year we have a uh, annual, um, we have an annual show, and, uh, and that's always fun. Uh, you know, they let you put in, it's not jurored, so you get to put in uh, any art that you want to put in, and uh, so that's, uh, that's worthwhile. And it's, uh, it's a great uh, social outing. But uh, yeah, I would, uh, for uh, anybody interested in uh, painting, uh, the, the advantage of watercolors is they're very easy to take uh, on site and, you know, hop in your car, go up to uh, the library cabin or uh, the library or someplace and uh, do a painting uh, because all you're dealing with are uh, uh, paints and uh, water and they, it dries typically uh, fairly quickly and you can uh, pack at home with acrylics and well acrylics are also have that feature uh, it's a little bit more of a setup with them but uh, with oils uh, you can't easily do that without having uh, a pizza box to put your uh, canvas in to keep it from getting on everything you're uh, dealing with because it doesn't dry uh, for quite a while, depending on uh, the paint you're using and the medium. But uh, it's been great. I love it. Uh, it's been a ex good experience. Uh, I have gone from uh, the little uh, starter kit to a travel kit, which is a little bit nicer. And, you know, I would recommend this. This uses uh, paint from a tube. And then I have a large palette. John Pike is uh, the brand name. But if you're interested in getting into art, and I would encourage it, uh, I, I'm going to give you two very important sources. One is YouTube, and the other one is um, Pinterest.
because you can go in there and key in the search box, uh, you know, the word art, and then pick it up from there, and it will direct you to how to do things, what has been done, people doing it, uh, demos online, uh, so on and so forth. And another couple of sources that I would recommend for uh, someone starting out would be uh, uh, get the catalog from uh, Blick. Uh, Dick Blick uh, is one of the big uh, art uh, supply houses. And another one here in Austin. Uh, is, how do you spell uh, that? How do you spell that, if I might just? Yeah. B as in boy, L I C K. Okay. Blick. Blick.com. Okay. They have an extensive catalog, and you can go in and learn an awful lot. Uh, you can learn an awful lot about uh, the mediums, the brushes, the uh, you know anything you really want to consider getting. And then uh, Jerry's Artorama, which is over at the intersection of uh, 2222, 183, and uh, Interstate 35, is uh, they also have a online uh, service, but they also have a store here in Austin that's uh, fascinating to go in. Uh, you can get overwhelmed, but uh, but it's uh, it's a treat to go and you know and they'll help you. They'll you know you can tell them you're starting out or you're you got this problem and and uh, so they're they're uh, helpful. But uh, there are a lot of great sources and uh, and I rely if, on all if, of if them. I might jump in, Cindy, for a sec. The, sure. Uh, so uh, you are a great source, <laughs> actually, uh, for me. You made a suggestion that in the beginning, or well, tell people what you do when you travel. You you carry something with you. Uh, well, a little book. Yeah, I do. I carry. Uh, you know, I I have. Uh, I I probably have uh, close to fifty sketchbooks. And I carry these sketchbooks and, uh, you know, I'll just sketch, uh, you know, when I drive down the road or uh, if I'm, uh, you know, I, I'll put anything in them that, uh, that I want to remember. Uh, and uh, so, uh, well, it's nothing. Uh, you, you also told me you carry it with you when you go on a plane, for example. Eh? I do. I do. Not and, away the uh, hours of the plane flight. Uh, or the travel, you, you know, in the car, or whatever. You oh yeah. As you go. Yeah, I, I, I've done a lot of sketches uh, waiting around in airports. I, uh, and uh, the advantage of that is that uh, it gives you a chance to kind of relive the experience in a better way than a photograph would do, because you are immersed when you are doing a sketch of, uh, you know. Terminal 23 at the airport, uh, you uh, you really, you know, one of the things they say about painting or sketching or drawing is the ability to do it well requires you to have the ability to see well. And so you uh, are always trying to perfect your, uh, your vision of what you're seeing and mentally uh, get that down on paper. And there's an adage that if you want to paint good, you really have to have the ability to draw good. And uh, so drawing is a big part of what I do. Uh, I will uh, sketch out uh, something that I want to paint and uh, you know maybe uh, fill it in a little bit and then go after the uh, watercolor or in my case, uh, the acrylic. But uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's been a, a good, uh, good way to spend my retirement. Uh, I don't have a studio, so I can't do oils. I'm in a uh, garage that has a uh, indoor carpeting on the floor, and that presents a little bit of a problem, plus the smell and the uh, location and everything uh, kind of uh, eliminates that. But uh, I've got a big setup for oils and, uh, I mean, for uh, watercolors and also uh, lots of uh, pens and markers and what have you I, I uh, good good I uh, could you show us around your you're literally sitting in your studio right now right? I am I'm in my studio uh, what, I have, what uh, do you recommend that you start with? this is the conversation you want to 
have a sketchbook, and then what do you buy when you go to the store? What do you look for in terms of uh, a, a, a pencil that's, and what kind of paper do you have in your sketchbook? Well, okay, here's, uh, you know, I've got a sketchbook that, uh, this is my studio in the garage, and I've got, uh, I've got a plethora of pens and pencils. I've got, uh, some uh, colored pencils here, and I've got, uh, this is my big palette for big art, and uh, water, and here are some other, these are other uh, pads that you can buy for uh, watercolor. When you get watercolor, you really need to get, uh, this is 140 pound, which means that a ream of 500 sheets weighs 140 pounds. And so uh, watercolor paper is rated by weight. So you'd want to get some watercolor paper. Uh, if you're uh, dealing with uh, uh, oils, uh, you know, there's a different style of brush. Uh, these are brushes for watercolor. And they are, uh, I don't know if you can see those, but. Uh, yeah. These are uh, watercolor brushes of different types. And then a wide. These, yeah, these are uh, oil brushes. And one of the major differences with an oil brush and a watercolor brush is the length of the brush because with watercolor, uh, you're going to be working a little bit closer because you're probably not going to be doing a major uh, painting, uh, meaning, you know, a two by four foot painting. And uh, with oils, uh, that's not uncommon to do one large and you want to stand away from an easel. But I have easels and uh, I've got some work in progress on the wall here. Oh, let's and see some of your artwork if we could. He is really, I'm proud of the work he has done. He's really uh, dramatically well, some of the art that I put up is not my art, uh, but art that inspires me. So, but I here, here's uh, I just happen to have some that. This is uh, a sketch I did in watercolor of a, a good friend of mine that uh, has crippled hands and works in leather. Uh, so uh, I did this for him. And uh, he is now 92 years old and still blowing and going. And then I did one, uh, for example, of my grandfather. That uh, this is a print. I gave the original away, but uh, this was, my grandfather was an engineer on the Santa Fe Railroad, and so this is a <laughs> just a watercolor of, uh, from a black and white photograph that I did. And I could show you, you know, more and more. Uh, a lot of what I've done lately is just kind of quick uh, pen and ink, pen and uh, watercolor type sketches. This is uh, my daughter's home in San Diego. And what else have I got here that I could show you? Ed, how often do you paint? Do you paint every day? And if so, I try to paint every day. Uh, and I've been doing a lot of, uh, one of the things I like to do is uh, greeting cards. And I would recommend that as a way to start out because you can do stuff that's, uh, you can do stuff that uh, can be done quickly and give you, uh, a chance to practice. Here is a greeting card that I just did for my uh, anniversary. Actually, don't tell my wife, but uh, th these are uh, some uh, watercolor flowers. Uh, you know, and then I do some. Uh, here's a uh, card that I did for uh, a family that just lost uh, their dad, and that's watercolor. But uh, basically, uh, I've kind of gone over time from large paintings, which I started out. I, my goal when I started out was to uh, become a signature member of a watercolor society. And uh, at the 
time I lived in New Mexico, and to become a, a signature member, you have to be jured in five shows. And uh, the juror uh, typically is a renowned artist from somewhere in the U.S., and uh, they come in, the society brings them in to, to be the juror. And uh, so the first uh, five large paintings I did, uh, fortunately, got in. And so I am a signature member of the New Mexico Watercolor Society. But from there, I just kind of downscaled and uh, started doing smaller works that I give away. And uh, so I really don't have a lot to show, to be honest, because I either give it away or uh, people want it. So I uh, send it on like uh, to relatives as gifts and so on. But uh, yeah, I'd, I'd recommend it. It's uh, it's been great. What do you think about taking um, classes at Michael's, for example? That I'm, I, you know, I haven't done that. I have taken, uh, over time, I've taken a lot of classes. Uh, I've taken some in Santa Fe. I've taken, uh, well, I've taken one in Santa Fe and uh, I've taken uh, three at the Scottsdale Artist School. And I do that because I have friends that live in Scottsdale and she is an artist and he uh, is very active in, in the Scottsdale Artist School. He's uh, head of the foundation. And uh, so they, they uh, put me up and I go over and uh, take uh, classes from, uh, you know, truly renowned artists, I mean, museum quality artists. And so it's really been great. Uh, but. Michael's I'm not too sure about. Uh, and as far as a uh, watercolor society, which are always good to get into because you're with other people of like interest, uh, sadly, there isn't one for Austin. There is a Texas watercolor society that I think applies to Austin. But uh, yeah, I haven't, I haven't taken classes since I've been here. I've been here since... Uh, 2018, and uh, before that, of course, lived in New Mexico, and uh, what a stimulus that is to live in that state. Uh, you know, talk about a haven for artists. Uh, there's a reason there's so many artists there. It's just, it's wonderful, and that's what got me started uh, at an early, early age, just being around great art. Well, and I'm sure that you've seen it really improve your um, ability to stay young, don't you think? You oh, yeah. Dwelling. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I spend, I spend an equal amount of time uh, trying to put together a painting mentally before I even pick up a brush. I spend as much time doing that as I do putting the painting down mm -hmm. uh, and doing the painting. Uh, it, it just... Uh, yeah, no, it keeps you young mentally. Uh, it's uh, exciting. It's fun, you know. And, and I might what's... pop in and say that, and it also, as part of the balance, what it does is exercises and rides bikes. Right, we ride uh, bikes together, uh, and so the art is not exclusive, you know, to your entire. Oh yeah, uh, you're, he leads a very active, balanced uh, life, just like Dennis. Uh, with walking, biking, uh, uh, and me, I found that the bike has been a passion that I enjoy sharing with. Uh, Good point. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, yeah. Brian and I uh, do a lot of biking, and uh, I really enjoy, enjoyed uh, Dennis's talk. Uh, you know, he got me all fired up. You know, I've got to get out and do some hiking. Uh, but. Uh, yeah, no, it, uh, it, it's a good balance. Uh, and typically what I'll do is uh, do art for a while, uh, typically in the, either, either in the uh, morning or in the afternoon, and then uh, alternate with uh, bike riding in the other part of the day. And, uh, and I, don't, I don't do these 300-mile uh, uh, bike rides, but I do, uh, you know, I go out and, and uh, ride for 30 to 30 minutes to an hour, and, and it's great. Good balance. Good point, Brian. I'm sitting in Fredericksburg, uh, Texas right now, and they have nice wide roads and uh, not a lot of hills and everything, and I've had a bad back, and I found that hiking 
has uh, given me a new outlet on, uh, on exercise. Uh, I'm, I, you know, walking uh, kind of backwards, uh, and I, I hop on that bike, and I can go and go and go, and uh, I go back maybe. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would. Uh, we have had some good rides together. Yes, and I would also point out that the, I had a chat with Dennis about before doing this um, this broadcast uh, about how. Um, balance for seniors is sometimes an issue and you know he wouldn't want people just to go out and hop on a bike uh, if you've never ridden a bike um, the uh, skill set is definitely one that's um, learned perhaps in your childhood and maybe forgotten but or, or requires a good set of balance but there are trikes now so the trikes give you stability uh, there's electric ones as well so uh, Dennis and I have been discussing that just before we actually got on uh, between this, uh, that that's a, a good route to go if you're a little unsure of your ability to balance. It. You might want to consider something. Like that. Yeah, good points. Good points. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you so much for being here today. I am not seeing any additional questions at this point, so I think we will just go ahead and log off for the day. But thank you all so much for being here. I learned a ton. And I know people are going to be wanting to reach out to uh, both of you to learn more about what you're doing. And we're just so happy that you to share your talents and gifts with us today. Thanks, That's Andy. Great. And, and thank you for the work that you do. This is just yes. a cool uh, asset for, uh, for the community, especially in these lockdown times when we uh, can't get together physically. Uh, the, this electronic world that uh, you're operating right now is a big deal. Excellent. Thank you, gentlemen. We'll see y'all next time. Thank Have you. a great week, everyone. Bye-bye.